Under parity. P inverse Q alpha P, where P is parity, equals, it has to give you some Q bar alpha dot, but to preserve indices, then we'll have sigma zero alpha beta dot times Q bar beta dot. With, then we can write as sigma zero alpha beta dot epsilon beta dot gamma dot q bar gamma dot. And uh, this is, should be OK up to a phase. And uh, the phase I will call mu. OK, it's only that what I'm saying is that a one, zero, one half zero object gets transformed to a zero one half object, but there can be a, a, a multiplicative phase that uh, would not play a, a role with, with, with take, um, uh, so. so, and would take modulus or so. And the same thing happened to, 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 to Q bar, say, alpha dot. This will be the complex conjugate phase <coughs> times then sigma bar zero alpha dot beta q beta and q beta I can write it like epsilon beta gamma Q gamma. OK. This is consistent. Writing these two phases, one as the complex conjugate of the other one, is consistent with the algebra with the algebras of the Qs. Q alpha, Q bar, alpha dot equals to 2 sigma mu, alpha, alpha dot, P mu. In the sense that we, we know that if we transform this quantity, you have to apply this quantity, to, uh, the transformation for Q and Q bar. And on the right hand side, the P transform such that P0 goes to itself under parity, and PI goes to minus PI. OK, so you, pl you plug these transformations here into this equation. I leave it as an exercise where you have to use properties of the epsilons and so on, that at the end you get precisely the right hand side knowing that uh, P, the piece transforms in, the way, in this way. OK, so that, that's the simple exercise that you can uh, do in a few minutes. <coughs> Furthermore, this implies that if you have You apply parity twice, so p minus 2 q alpha p2 q alpha. You, you do not get back q alpha, but you get it with the minus sign. So also, the minus sign, again, you get it when you do this with the properties of the, of the especially of the sigma matrices and the epsilon tensors. So it's not trivial, the action of the uh, parities on, on Qs. However, for what? For the state that we are interested, for massive n equals 1 multiplet with a zero super spin, we had 
a vacuum state in the representation labeled by M zero spin P mu and J3 equal to zero. This vacuum state, remember, it was annihilated by A1 and A2 That was essentially the free, that's how we, we build it, this state. Then, out of this state, we created the A1 or A2 dagger acting on omega. And that gave us objects, <coughs> that gave us objects of spin one. One half, I'm sorry. And the interesting state that we had found was a uh, state A1 dagger, A2 dagger acting on omega, which is not zero because A1s and A2s are different. And this was a state also of the form which is different from omega. In particular, it's different from omega because this state is not annihilated by the A's, but it's annihilated by A daggers. So let, let's call this uh, omega prime. Omega prime, I define it to be this state. And then we know that this state is annihilated by the A daggers and not the A's. Okay. So in some sense, it's a, we could have started with omega prime and then build up the rest of the, of the states by applying A's instead of A daggers, as we did starting with the omegas. <coughs> but uh, the point that I want to make is that uh, essentially omega and omega prime are related by exchanging A to A dagger, or A to A dagger means Q to Q bar. Remember that the A's are proportional to the Q's and the A daggers are proportional to the Q bars. Okay? So, and I will finish now. So under, under, so under parity, essentially we have that omega and omega prime are interchanged because the Q's and the Q bars are interchanged. And from this, then we can construct states which are uh, eigenstates of parity, and they have one will have parity equals to plus one, and the other one will have parity equals to minus one. And that's precisely the scalar and pseudo-scalar that I was talking about. So the explanation is a little bit more complicated. These states have parity plus or minus one. That means that it's a, the plus I will call a scalar, and the minus is pseudo-scalar. And that is uh, the real story, I think, of, of this um, difference between these two states. It's just that the, they, they are differentiated by parity, not by the spin or their mass or momentum, but by parity. And it's not one being the scalar and the other one the pseudo-scalar, but just two combinations of them. One is even under parity, and the other one is odd under parity. OK. So, Sorry for the confusion. It was one of those things that uh, it occurred to me to mention it just while I was writing on the blackboard, uh, and, the, and I did, didn't have it in my notes. But I think this is uh, the way to explain it. There's a nice discussion about uh, this in, uh, in, the, in Weinberg's uh, volume three, I think, chapter 25, if I remember. 
Okay, end of the aside. Yes? Sorry? I must have missed why omega omega can't get exchanged on a parity. Yes, thank you. They are exchanged on the parity because remember that omega and omega prime are really, uh, they have the similar properties with respect to A and A dagger. Yeah. And A and A dagger are exchanged on the parity. So, because A is Q's and the A daggers are Q bars. So, the, so at some point you will get, for instance, uh, all these, uh, all these things with the faces and so on, but essentially one is changed to the other one. Q goes to Q bar up to, up to the faces. And by the way, the, usually the face is chosen to be mu equals to i, and that's what I was mentioning in my, like, during my lecture. Okay, so end of the aside. And let me just go back to what we were talking about, which was what. <coughs> we were in the section 2.3, extended supersymmetry. And I essentially wrote for you the, the generalization of the algebra, of supersymmetry algebra that goes beyond the simple supersymmetry n equals to 1. The extension is uh, all essentially straightforward except for the introduction of the, of, the, of the central charges that I call Z. Uh, and still we haven't used them yet. I will try to use them today. But uh, uh, st we started with the representations. And the representations First, of course, we have the massless case. And in the massless case, we realized that the representations were, for arbitrary n, they had two to the n states. And with helicities, starting from uh, lambda minimum to lambda maximum which was equal to the lambda minimum plus n over 2. So <clears throat> and this was uh, in general. And uh, <clears throat> we extracted several comments from this. And we were with the comments. As I say, they just, well, lambda max minus lambda min equals n over 2. So that means that if we want lambda to be smaller or equal to 1, properties of a renormalizable field theories, then we concluded that n has to be less or smaller than 4, and that's why. I emphasize that n equals to four supersymmetry is special because it's a, is the more is the most symmetric one uh, before introducing gravity, for instance, and that's why it has a lot of beautiful properties, especially when when quantized. It's the source of many of these strong weak coupling dualities and so on, and it's the theory that is better understood in that regard. So that n equals to four is special, and the multiplet that. Uh, uh, it's described by n equals to 4 is the n equals to 4 vector multiple that I showed you in the previous lecture. The other comment that is where I stop is that if we want helicity to be less than or equal than 2, and the justification for stopping at 2 is because uh, helicity 2 is gravity, uh, <coughs> so then we, we had. Um, that n has to be smaller than 8. So let, let me just say a bit more about n equals, uh, uh, why this is, uh, is, really, is uh, a strong constraint. So what I want to say is that why we want to impose 
n equals to 8 to be the maximum number of supersymmetries that we can have. So n equals to 8 will be the maximum number of supersymmetries. So in general, I say maximum number of supersymmetries is the maximum number of supersymmetry generators. Because you have Q alpha A and Q bar alpha dot B, where A and B goes from 1 to N, and N will be, I'm telling you that it's, it's the maximum is N equals to 8. So, so the arguments are as follows. As, as follow. So as I say, we want lambda to be smaller or equal than 2. That's an old argument by... Uh, Weinberg especially, and there is, 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 is what I, I say all the other day, and I, I will emphasize, is that it's a strong belief that, uh, that there are no massless particles of uh, helicity greater than two. Okay. The argument about this is that the argument is that all massless particles of uh, helicity greater or equals greater than one half, they have to couple to conserve charges. Massless particles, and to be more precise, is at low momentum. Couple to conserve charges, or to conserve uh, currents. Conserve. That means that d mu j mu equal to zero. If, for instance, this is for uh, electromagnetism, and we know that if there is a conserved current in electromagnetism, so then the corresponding particle is this is, will be a particle couple, coupling to this current a mu j mu, and that will be the gauge uh, electromagnetic field. And, and the conserved quantity at the end will be an electric charge, which will be the integral over space of the zero component of the current. And uh, the same thing happens. If you, uh, so, so this is for lambda equals to plus or minus one. For lambda equals to plus or minus two, the conserved uh, conserved current is the stress energy tensor, the corresponding conserved charge is the four momentum, and uh, and that's okay, but. Uh, Beyond that, there are no more conserved currents that you can couple to. Therefore, there are no more conserved currents with more indices here that a particle that is of helicity greater than two will couple to. So it, there, are, there, there are no things like that. So there are no more conserved currents, and therefore there are no more um, uh, massless particles that can couple to them. Okay. So that's a. Uh, you want a reference again? Reference for this is. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, 
and this is a uh, look at this uh, Weinberg chapter 13. So that is, that is volume one. And this argument was extended for supersymmetry. So extended for, for uh, fermionic conserved quantities in an article by Brissaro and Pendleton, 1977, I think. Okay, so that means that there will be, what Grissaro and Pendleton say, well, there will be another current which will correspond to spin three halves. Let's say I jump from lambda equals to plus or minus one to lambda equals to plus or minus two, but there will be a, a, a still a current for lambda equals to plus or minus three halves, and the conserved current will be the conserved current associated to supersymmetry that I will, I will mention too, and the corresponding particle will be the spin three halves uh, gravitino object. But the point about here is that beyond two, we cannot go. And uh, <clears throat> the reason is, is just this strong belief. It's, it's not, uh, uh, all this is true, but this is only ref refer referring to, for instance, the proof that Weinberg provi provi provides in chapter 13 is just about soft photon in any, in any uh, scattering process. And, and uh, <clears throat> So photon means of a low momentum, and that will be an object that will mediate a long range interactions. So he said, well, eventually, you may have part objects with the higher helicity, but they, they will not have these properties at low momentum, or they will not mediate long range interactions. So uh, still there is room for, for having objects with a helicity greater than two, although it's strongly believed that there, there is no real consistent field theory that describes them or there is no real theory that describes them. Okay, this is very important because this is, this is telling us that there is a maximum number of supersymmetries. We cannot just continue on. And that's, uh, this is also the same argument, is on the basis to say that the number of space-time dimensions will not, will not be more than 11. So it's exactly the same argument. Uh, probably you have heard that uh, there is a uh, maximum number of dimensions that is 11. Have you heard about that? No? Yes. So, and the argument is identical. It's the same argument. So, <clears throat> okay. So, that means that we have a, a, a limit, and n equals 2, 8 is nice because, uh, because, um, <clears throat> it's the maximum. So, n equals 2, 8 is maximum. And as I told you before, there is one single multiplet for which you have <coughs> lambda to be plus or minus two. There is a one state, lambda plus or minus three halves. There are eight states, so then this is eight gravitini. You said the number of supersymmetries equals the number of gravitini in, this, in the gravity multiplet. Because remember that this, we got this one from that one by acting on the creation of operators that were n. So you have n equals to s, so you have eight, eight gravitini. Spin uh, helicity plus or minus one, there are seven, uh, let me see, how many? 28 plus or minus a half. 56 and 0, there are 70. <clears throat> okay, so this is a special. Another argument to, to see that n equals to 8 is a maximum is that also for n greater than 8. What will happen? For n greater than 8, we can start with multiples with, a, say, helicity greater than uh, 2. And then when you get applying the creation of operators, you will get a states of helicity 2 will be more than 1. Okay? But the states of helicity 2 are the gravitons. 
So you have n greater than 8. This will imply more than one graviton, or many of them, but at least more than one. And of course, that would be very strange, because it would be that you have a theory with many gravity. <laughs> OK, many, so many gravity uh, uh, mediators. The graviton is the particle that mediated gravitational interactions. And if you have n greater than 8, the multiplets will have more than one object of helicity plus or minus 2. So that means that we'll have more than one uh, carriers of the gravitational force. <coughs> OK. As I told you the other day, this, this multiplet is nice uh, because it, it includes particles of, of, of all the spins that we know and expect to find. The, the graviton, gauge bosons, well, the gravitinos, plus or minus a half, uh, that will be matter for, uh, fields, and uh, spin zero objects will be like a, a Higgses or so on. So eventually, th this will have been a nice way of, of, uh, of finding uh, a unified theory that includes all the particles that, that we know. Unfortunately, it didn't work. And it didn't, sorry? Against 28 particles of spin one, mm -hmm. I don't think we have uh, so many bosons, do we? Oh, well, we can have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, in a grand unified theory, imagine SO10 has 45. Oh. Yes. Um, so you would accept? Uh, yes, I, I, I wouldn't stop sleeping because yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so you can have. Uh, remember, you can have gauge symmetries as big as you want, and then they are spontaneously broken. So 28 will, 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 I think, is the number of generators of SO8, which is not a big group. So in principle, we, have, we can have a, uh, we can have a, at least, we have to have at least those generators of SU3 crosses 2 crosses 1. So there's a minimum that has to have include the, it has to include the standard model at least. But for maximum, since we know about uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, we, we, we can live with many. But is there a general argument that uh, several graviton, uh, gravitons are forbidden? Well, no, no, that's the thing, because uh, we know about the spontaneous symmetry breaking. There may be uh, an argument. That's why uh, this is not a full, a strong theorem that you said this is impossible. But this is the, 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 the idea. We, nobody knows any way to, to, to make sense of several massless gravitons, uh, as far as I know. Of many of them, yes. Sorry, you had a question? No, questions. The same? Yes. Very good. That's a very good question. It's a very deep question. It's difficult to answer in, in, uh, in this class, in this supersymmetry class. Uh, but that, that is, uh, you have seen gravity as, is, if I know you, especially because of being here, <laughs> uh, for you, gravity is just geometry. And gravity, you can see the geometry of space time. And, and, uh, and this is the way that Einstein thought about it. And, and uh, uh, but there was a parallel discovery in, in the 60s by Feynman and Weinberg that they say, well, forget about all these geometrical things. Let's try to describe a theory of, uh, of uh, fields corresponding to helicity plus or minus 2. And when they tried to build that, they recovered Einstein's theory of gravity. OK, so that's a, essentially it's a beautiful way of seeing. It's a pure field theoretical argument. And then you, you recover all this geometri uh, geometry uh, um, uh, properties of, of, of gravity. And the way that particle physicists see gravity may be in this way. It's just a, a field theory of uh, spins of uh, particles, of massless particles of, of helicity plus or minus 2. Uh, and the geometrical interpretation is nice, but uh, in principle, as, as a field theory, it, that, that's the way we, we, we proceed. And that's the way we know how to do calculations and so on, because we know um, how to do things with the field theory. The person, yeah? In principle, but then yes, exactly. So you can still you have this field theory in in, uh, in Minkowski space with of spin of, of particles of spin plus or minus two, and then from that you 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 build up the whole structure and you get that there is a Riemann tensor object and then that you have uh, the uh, the most general object that you can write as an action happens to be the Einstein-Hilbert action and so on and then you essentially recover all all, all, all gravity, but you started as, as a field theory for particles of spin plus or minus two. 
The difference between this theory and uh, other theories is that it's not renormalizable. So then you have to, to deal with non-renormalizable theories, and then, then you, you know precisely that's precisely the problem of quantizing gravity because it's tra trying to treat gravity at the quantum level. But uh, it, there is nothing wrong with a non-renormalizable theory as long as we treat it as an effective field theory. So it's valid up to up to a certain limit, up to certain energies, and that's what, the way that people are treating these theories of uh, of, of gravity. Um, okay, so that's that's. It. <clears throat> okay, so this is a. It's a nice uh, uh, result. It's an important result that tells us that the, the maximum of, of, of number of supersymmetries, and that tells us that it's very interesting to have more than one supersymmetry because they have a unification of of of, uh, of uh, many particles. However, I haven't finished with my comments. The next comment is to tell you that all of these extended supersymmetries have nothing to do with the real world. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So let me try to convince you. <clears throat> the magical word here is chirality. We know, I hope you, you will, you are learning now, you are uh, knowing, that the standard model is, is a very contrived model. So we know all these interactions and, and particles, but they happen to have this property that the standard model is chiral, it's intrinsically chiral. That means that it differentiates left and right. So parity essentially is not conserved. So there's a difference between left and right, and the standard model is chiral. However, uh, I will try to argue now that is that for the multiples where when n is greater than one will be intrinsically non-chiral, and then then we, we, it will be very difficult to accommodate the standard model within that. Okay, so, so for ext all extended supersymmetries, the multiples will be non-chiral. The reason is that uh, <clears throat> let me just assume for the moment that uh, there, is an internal, there is internal symmetry in, in the, and internal symmetry commutes with supersymmetry. So that, that's the, the most generic case. And uh, <coughs> if the internal symmetry commutes with supersymmetry, that means that in, a, in every single multiplet that we have seen from standard supersymmetry, except for one, and the one is the one I told you in the previous class, which is called the hypermultiplet. Remember the hypermultiplet of n equals to two? So it's all extended supersymmetry multiples except for that, for that one. So argument. All extended supersymmetry multiples, with the exception The n equals to two hypermultiplet they have helicity plus or minus one particles. Okay. That means that they have gauge bosons. We know that if the gauge symmetry is a, a commutes with supersymmetry, which is the standard case, but for any gauge symmetry, we know that the corresponding particles, uh, the gauge particles, transform in a particular representation of the corresponding group. That representation is called the adjoint representation. That you are experts now in group theory, so you know that the adjoint representation is special. And, and precisely the carriers of the forces or the, the corresponding gauge particles in, within a group that, uh, uh, that uh, give you the corresponding gauge fields of, 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 a, of, a, of a symmetry group, of a local symmetry group, the, the gauge bosons transform in the adjoint representation.
The joint representation is real. And then, non chiral. Okay. So this will imply that the corresponding particles of spin plus or minus a half within the same multiplet, they will transform under the same representation. And then it will not be chiral. They will transform in the same representation, and therefore, the corresponding model will not be chiral. I will try to, to be more uh, explicit. We know in the standard model, we know in the standard model that we have quarks and leptons. Those are the, 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 the matter particles. And they transform differently left and right. Left and right. <coughs> so in the sense that, uh, for instance, the leptons are doublets of SU2. The left-handed leptons are doublets of SU2, whereas the right-handed leptons are singlets. So this is completely different left and right. This, these representations are uh, complex representations. The, this, uh, they are fundamental representations of the corresponding group. So they are complex representations. And they can be chiral. You can just have the left ones in one representation and the right in another representation. In the, in the joint representation, remember that the joint, think about, say, the SU3 that you know very well. So the joint is made out of 3 times 3 bar. That gives you the 8 plus 1, remember? The 8 is the joint of SU3. So since you have 3 and 3 bar together within the 8, that means that you're having it's a real representation. So you're having the, the, trip, the triplet and the anti-triplet part. Okay, so that, that you cannot differentiate between the, 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 the two complex uh, conjugate representations. Okay, so that's, that's what happens in the joint. If the multiples are in the joint, then there's no chirality. There is no way to differentiate the right and the left-handed. So, so, because we know that the standard model particles fit into complex representations, which are, the, say, the fundamental representation. So we know the standard model particles live on complex representations, like a fundamental. Okay. There's still a possibility that you say, well, probably. It's we could use one of these R symmetries, the symmetries that do not commute uh, with supersymmetry, and that we may have a way to fix that the, uh, the bosons transform in one, one way and the fermions transform in another way. That you can do it case by case, it's very limited, and didn't work either. So at the end, uh, this argument is very, very strong. But still, there is a hope. The hope that there is an exception. The exception is the n equals to 2 hypermultiplet. So probably n equals to 2 will be OK, if, as long as we have the hypermultiplet. So let's see what happens to the hypermultiplet. For the n equals to 2 hypermultiplet, remember that n equals to 2 hypermultiplet, I wrote it. <coughs> um, as follows, if I if I remember correctly, I wrote it like that. That was a, a pair of two n equals to one kernel multiplets. So one with helicity plus a half, and the other one with helicity minus a half. 
But here you can see already that the object, if the fermions of Felicity plus a half, comes with the, together with the fermion of Felicity minus a half. So they come together. So you cannot separate again the left and the right. Okay. So it's also non chiral since. Object with helicity plus a half is to, it comes together with the object with helicity minus a half. So essentially, the, the object and, 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 and the CPT conjugate will come together. For, for instance, the standard model takes a left handed neutrinos. They are completely different from right handed neutrinos. They have different helicities. So here they have to come together. So again, it's non chiral. So that kills. All the n greater than uh, one, essentially. All the, for all the multiples of n greater than one, you cannot fit the standard modeling. So that leaves us with two options now: n equals to one and n equals to zero. Okay. So let's do. Let's see what happens. n equals to 1 and 0 can be chiral. Why? Because a multiplet, for instance, for instance, in n equals to 1, we have a multiplet like, a, say, 1 half 0 that doesn't have to come with its CPT conjugate necessarily. The minus a half 0 doesn't come with it. So you can, you can have it by itself in a multiplet, so that can be chiral. Okay. And of course, n equals to 0 is any field theory you have worked before. So of course, the standard model itself is n equals to 0, and, and it's chiral. So n equals to 1 is our hope. You can have a chiral theory in n equals to 1. However, in, in n equals to 1, it has a prediction already that I, I, I told you uh, when we discussed um, <coughs> n equals to 1. predicts at least one extra particle for each standard model particle. So that means that for the quarks, these quarks, for the leptons, these leptons, and uh, for the gauge bosons, the gauge and so on. And uh, but these particles have not been observed. Mm -hmm. So they have not been observed. And uh, they should have been observed in supersymmetry words there, because uh, they, they should have the same mass as the particles that we know, because they, they, they will be in the same multiplet. So what are we left with? So we kill n greater than 1. For n equals to 1, we have this prediction. This prediction is clearly violated in nature. So this may be the end of this course. Okay, there's nothing, nothing to go. <laughs> uh, uh, but wh what is the way out? Any, any, any suggestion? So, what, 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 what can, what can we do now? Perfect. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Very good. So the, the only way out is the supersymmetry is the broken symmetry. Okay, we are used now that the nature can have many more symmetries than we have been able to observe, because we know now the concept of spontaneously broken symmetries. So that means that we don't observe the symmetry in the vacuum. doesn't mean that the symmetry is not there. It may, it may, the theory may be uh, symmetric, although the, the state of minimum energy will not be symmetric. So, so the only hope we have is that for supersymmetry to play a role is to have any spontaneously broken n equals to 1 supersymmetry. Okay?
This is to be fair. Is this is at low energies? What low energies means? I know you don't like numbers, but this is ten to the two GeV or so. Okay. <clears throat> so extended supersymmetries may be able to play a role, probably at higher energies or, or in, because of extra dimensions and so on. And uh, I have to be also fair with the uh, extended symmetries, extended supersymmetries, that, that they can play a role as as uh, as uh, laboratories, as, as theoretical laboratories of so theories which are simple and can be uh, worked with. In particular, the n equals to four super, uh, supersymmetric theory has been played in that role. So we are learning a lot about uh, non-perturbative effects in in field theories by studying a very simple and symmetric theory, which is n equals to four. And, and that, that, that is all very, it's, it's a lot of knowledge. It's, it's, it is knowledge in, equal, in field theory more than looking for just a standard model. However, if we insist on, on something that can be observed by nature, this is the one that has the, the hope. I will mention later, and I, as I mentioned in uh, my first lecture, that n equals to 1 is important because it's also, hopefully, it's, 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 uh, it solves one of the important problems of the standard model, which is the hierarchy problem. So it's also expected to play a role at low energies. And uh, so that means that we will still continue in this class next time. So there's still something to be done.